a long time ago on a comics page far, far away. Welcome to Panel Up, your monthly pop culture panel. I'm John Campbell. And I am Mike Gergoni. Oh, oh, Gergoni. Mm, we're in the dog days of summer, as they say. Why are they called that? You know, I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> you know I what? assumed it was for a werewolf reason, but I was recently proven well, wrong. I, I always assume everything's for a werewolf reason, so. Because mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> the moon is so full. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, it's I don't know. I just throw that around. It's going to be something offensive. I, that's always I throw that around like, oh, super offensive or something. Okay, sorry, Jesus. Um, no, I have okay, no. Okay, no. Oh. The phrase is a reference to Sirius, the dog star. During the dog days period, the sun occupies the same region of the sky as Sirius, the brightest star visible from any part of Earth. Well, wow. there you go. Wow. Okay. All right. There you go. There it is. Perfect. Uh, and you learn something new every day. Anyway, Batman. Oh, yeah. Well, because we did say... I'm going to stop announcing what we're going to do, because we always end up changing. We were going to do the Borderlands movie, but I just there's no reason to, to pile on to that. I don't feel we have anything to add to that discussion. Other it than, turns out it's a bad video game movie. Who'd I know. Funk? Here's the thing, though. I think people are... I, I, no, I haven't seen it, and I'm sure it's terrible. I, I mean, I have no reason to disbelieve countless people saying that. Um, but I will just say... Um, it's probably not that bad. Like it's probably bad, but you know, I mean, when you've got Uwe Boll coming out and going, "I bet you wish I had made it," I'm like, "No, I don't." <laughs> even if this is bad, that would have been worse. So, I have seen it. Oh, you saw it? Oh, I did see it. It is. Did you wish Uwe Boll directed it? No, no, <laughs> never, not once. <laughs> no, of course not. It is a movie that suffers from. Two things, in my opinion. One, long trailing production. There are clearly a ton of hands on this ball, and it like you can kind of feel it disconnected at certain parts. I I think this movie definitely would have gone through ten to fifteen drafts of different, probably writers and takes and tones. And it it feels like it. It really does. Uh, Because I think Eli Roth was late in the game on being director. He came in like right before, you know. The second thing I think it really suffers from is all of the actors are slumming it. <laughs> yeah. And and some of them know it and some of them don't. And that disconnect really hurts the movie. Well, everybody's like, I mean, even when they announce it, they're like, Kate Blanchett's in this? I think it stems from like, okay, it was the middle of the pan- I think she's even said this in an interview. It was the middle of the pandemic and she just needed to get out of the house. <laughs> yeah. Well, I will say from the like social media and stuff like that, I think everybody had a great time making it. I'm sure it was sure. a blast. Everybody seems to really like each other. That does not a good movie make, but yeah. Uh, why did they need to recast the voice of Claptrap to be Jack Black? Because he's Kung Fu Panda and his name sells movie tickets. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, the, the, that that movie had studio fingerprints all over it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so it's decisions like that that irrevocably make that movie into another and a long list of video game movies that uh, miss the point. But yes, but you would say, uh, but I think then you are saying what I kind of assumed is the thing. It's another one of these. Not this is a particularly low moment. Uh, No, I mean, (laughs) blood rain, it ain't. (laughs) <laughs> that's, well, because that's the thing about the Uwe Boll comment, uh, and I, I might have just watched an Uwe Boll movie in recording, <laughs> uh, where we also talked about this. Uh, but it is a thing where where it is sort of going like, no, because even the worst Eli Roth movie, even him on the most checked out paycheck gig, has a better understanding of story and visual sensibility than you do. So, you know, K- I mean, Kate Blanchett on her worst day is no. still Kate Blanchett. <laughs> that's what I mean. It's got a great cast. Uh, a, a solid director. So even if it's weak studio product, it's probably still at least like passably slick. It the CG doesn't playing. look bad. Yeah, that's what I mean. I'm saying like it's 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 a lot of top talent. I, it sounds like what I would assume script is the is the major problem. Script and like lazy CG action sequences that are clearly like tacked onto each other because they need to fill some space between the footage that they actually have. I mean, yeah, yeah stuff like that. 
I mean, it's it's a weird thing, and I love. I'm a big Eli Roth fan, but I will say he's a weird choice for that. Yeah, and look, is the are they striking while the iron's hot for a Borderlands movie? Not exactly. Well, that's been a big problem with a lot of these, right? Is the is yeah. that they do always take forever to come into existence? That by that time, I mean, the Uncharted franchise was long over by the time that we had an Uncharted movie. Right. And even something as critically beloved as The Last of Us is coming after that series was sort of like cooling, but it came out quick enough after the second game that there was still at least a little heat in the air. So when that show comes back into the zeitgeist, people are reignited to analyze that franchise again. It's also really fucking good, which helps. It's also a really fucking good show. <laughs> and I mean, F- Fallout dodged it entirely by sort of making it this uh, timeless story that just used yep. the setting, right? Perfect. I, I, yeah, I think uh, we've, I mean, look, we did a whole episode about Fallout. Yeah. It's amazing, of course. But that being said, something else came out too that really struck our fancy. And I actually, in retrospect, can't believe we didn't just assume we would be talking about Batman because I'm always about to talk about Batman. Uh, <laughs> people have asked me to stop talking about Batman in a lot of places, uh, and I will never consider that. Well, especially a Batman who has a Bruce Tim at the helm, right? Oh. Do, I'll, I'll just say this right now. Does anyone, and I, I, I might even include comics creators, does anyone get this character as well as this guy? I don't think so. Barring one crucial exception that we'll get into. Uh, <laughs> yes, I agree. I just think he, I, I mean, like, and look, he's done a ton of stuff, of course, across the DC universe, most of which has been great. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and you know, he's he's been shepherding the thing. I think the thing people always talk about, why don't they just put him in charge of the movies? I don't I don't know that he wants to do that, number one. I don't know if they want him to do that. I don't know if he wants to do that. But there there is if I was him, I kinda of wouldn't because just keep carving out your niche. And if everybody keeps saying it's better, why would you abandon that? Be over there doing the a better alternative. But mm-hmm. what I'm saying is as much as he's touched all there's clearly a particular love of Batman, right? For him that that's that's what he keeps coming back to when you're talking about a guy who's responsible in part obviously him and paul dini are like the two-hander that goes into the original animated series yeah yeah that that core creative team but yes from the most creative thing be him and dini of course um but yes when you've created what a lot of people consider to be like the platonic ideal of batman and that like Anything going forward is going to in some way echo that yeah. for either in direct like uh, like chorus with it or as a refutation of that material. Because I think as great as the Superman animated series is, and as much as I think it is objectively a platonic ideal of the character in the universe, it doesn't have the same cachet culturally. Mm-hmm. People love it. I mean, it's great. But it doesn't... Batman, there was something about Batman the animated series... The visuals, the sensibility. Also, it was... I, I think Superman was also, because it came second, was it was like, well, of course, that'll be good. Mm-hmm. If those guys did it. Batman came, and people, there was no reason... That show was made in the most... We were just talking about Borderlands. That show was made in the most corporate... Hey, Batman movies are really popular. We should be doing something on kids' TV with Batman. There should be a Batman Saturday morning show. Was the, So it's the most... At, but lo, they just happened to have one guy at Warner Brothers Animation who's like... I love this more than anything, and I completely see what this is. <laughs> so that show is maybe the ultimate example of being way better than it should have been. Yeah, yeah. It, and almost anyone else running that thing, it wouldn't have been as good as it was. And instead, it's a masterpiece. So when you hear that that guy, who is like one of the lead uh, captains of that ship, is taking another crack at it, and look, he's done other Batman stuff animated wise between then and now but But this this is is the first like long form one yeah and it feels like it's really going to have the tim stamp because a lot of the stuff they've been doing with batman and all the dc characters is adapting other people's stuff right it is the animated version of dark knight returns or they did the trilogy of the grant morrison comics or stuff like that so it's it's been him translating somebody else. This is the this is the first time I feel like since Batman the Animated Series it's like, ooh, this is Tim's take on the character. Which of course is still just, you know, born in the comics. I mean, he's obviously pulling a lot from that. And one of the things I loved about 
this as well that got me further excited. You not only hear Bruce Tim coming back to Batman, but he's going to hire a staff almost entirely made up of comics creators. <laughs> Which you would think like, oh, a doy, if you're going to make a show about one of these characters, why would you just not hire the people who have written these they had, characters? They had some, you know, Len Wein wrote episodes of the animated series. They did have some on the, on the animated series as well, but this time it really is. I mean, when you don't have Paul Dini... You know, you're like, oh, no, bummer, no Paul Dini. What's this? Ed Brubaker's now your head writer, though? <laughs> well, that's pretty good. That guy knows Batman. Uh, Ed Brubaker's yeah. written great Batman stories. Gr- Greg Rucka? Who's that guy? Oh, I mean, <laughs> Brubaker Rucka wrote what is one of my favorite Batman comics that doesn't even really have Batman in it, which is Gotham Central. And there's mm. a lot of Gotham Central in this. You can there's definitely a- feel, you can feel a lot of the, what they did in that. The amount of Montoya we got in this show was surprising, and I really I, enjoyed it. I do too, and that definitely stems from specifically when you hire Ruck and Brubaker. They love that character, right? Like that's mm-hmm. very clear. Particularly Rucka. Rucka Montoya is such a Rucka character. Uh, I can't remember. Did he? Is he responsible for? I may be wrong. Check me in the comments. Is he responsible for her becoming the question? I feel oh, like. Oh, I don't know. Right. I feel like that might have been Rucka when when she took over the question from Vic Sage. Uh, I feel like that's the that's the case, but mm. you know, you know. But Rucka created Batwoman as well and stuff like that. I mean, he's he's been uh, big and in, uh, in creating more uh, what might upset people diverse female superheroes <laughs> in the DC universe. Mm-hmm. Uh, but of course, Montoya also though originally created by Bruce Tim and Paul Dini. In the animated series. She wasn't a character in the comics prior to that. I mean, that's another thing, too. When you talk about the legacy, and we don't really have to cover it too much, of course, because everybody knows. But, like, Harley Quinn, Montoya, like, things from the animated series were so... Mr. Freeze's backstory is all Paul Dini's creation for the show. Right. That shocks people that, like, prior to uh, A Heart of Ice, that episode that, that, that brought in him and gave him that backstory... None of that stuff about his wife or any of that existed prior to the animated series. No, he was just a Captain Cold knockoff, essentially. Or and actually, yeah. who, came, who came first? I don't actually know. Ooh, that's a good question. Uh, we'll keep talking as I research in the background. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but, but yeah, so seeing those guys get their hands on the ball for these characters, but then also trying to bring it back to this sort of, I mean, gothic is maybe the overbearing term we might use here but pulp sensibility also of Noir. this like yeah yeah because this is a show that the first teaser image of it had batman with the big kind of ridiculous looking ears and so people were like oh we're going back to golden age batman for this visually certainly and actually yeah. uh, by the way uh Captain Cold came first, 57, then 59 so two years apart okay so yeah uh mr freeze captain cold knockoff <laughs> Which is interesting because even though they both have like ice guns, I now in no way conflate them. No, because they're very different characters in the modern so, age for sure. They've been so clearly defined now. But yes, at the time it was like uh, if one of them showed up, you'd be like, okay, like one guy's got like a bucket on his head and the other guy wears a parka. <laughs> Honestly, these days, I think of Captain Cold mostly as Golden Glider's shitty brother. <laughs> Uh, I mean, it, it goes to show you that the 66 show had three different actors playing Mr. Freeze over the course, and nobody cared. <laughs> it, it's just like he didn't make any kind of impression, really. It was mm-hmm. just like, okay, yeah. Oh, Mr. Freeze is back. That wasn't the last guy? Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I think that, but yes, uh, it it does feel... I mean, the the big thing for this that, of course, got every Batman fan to be like, oh, yeah, it was Bruce Tim setting out going like, well, now that this is a streaming show, I'm unshackled. I'm going to get I'm going to basically get to do what I wanted to what I would have wanted in my wildest dreams to do with animated series mm-hmm. but without having to be on children's television and adhering to not only network standards, but m- I mean, if uh, as the kind of nerd I am, I've watched all the documentaries and listened to all the commentaries on the Batman anime series Blu-ray set. And, and <laughs> kids' television, of course, is even under really strict uh, right. broadcast guidelines. So, I mean, they you know they had to fight to have guns on the show. When you, you know? hear that, though, when you hear a creator say, oh, I'm unshackled by television yeah. strictures and children's TV uh, like uh, standards and practices, you yeah. immediately think, oh, they're going to go like real grim and gritty and full Zack Snyder, right? 
what I love about this show is that, okay, it is unshackled by uh, uh, kids WB standards and practices, but yeah. that doesn't mean that it's not trying to be like Batman to its core and Batman to its core isn't some kind of like, I'm going to go into a room with the Batmobile and kill everyone with machine guns. Look, there are some cool scenes from Batman v Superman where Batman is fighting, but one of the problems with that movie is like how grim and gritty and dark and off the leash it is. That is because that, because he, as the thing with Snyder and I'm always the Snyder apologist of, of this podcast network without being a Snyder bro, but Snyder has latched onto a specific Batman that does exist, but it is more in the fringe of it. He is really writing Frank Miller Batman. That is yeah. his Batman. Uh, and that is a specific Batman that is not to everyone's taste, and that's totally fair. But the thing about it is, is Tim has continued the animated series. He is still trying to write platonic ideal Batman. He is still trying mm-hmm. to write a Batman that is Batman to Batman's core, it's not because that's the thing. He's not writing R-rated content. He's not pushing any content. He's just not holding back anymore. I think that's the thing. Mm-hmm. It is now overtly written for adults, but that yeah. doesn't mean it's it's R-rated or just filled with blood and foul language and sex. It just means that death is on the table. Like they couldn't kill anyone on the animated series, really. Right. It when you have the first episode of this show with the penguin killing her own son. That was the moment that made me go like, oh shit, this is for realsies. Okay. It's, I definitely found that just with the first fight when Batman's fighting penguin henchmen on the boat and you're just like, oh, I heard a guy's bones break when he hit him. Like he Mm -hmm. cracked that guy's rib. And it's not like grim, the guy's not bleeding, but you're just like, oh, when Batman hit a guy, he really fucking hurt him. You know, it's as opposed to just the big cartoon suck him in the jaw, which is awesome. And the way Bruce Tim animated that and everybody at animated series was amazing, but it was much more stylistic. Not that this isn't stylized too, but there's a, there is a, there's a grittiness to it without being grim and gritty, but it is gritty. It is old school, but old school, right? And it's the, the, the noir is the Gothic noir is really at the forefront of this. But they're also not leaning away from the fantastical over the topness of no. Batman. Because again, right it's off the bat in that ground, first episode, it's not real. You have a freaking World War One mortar artillery disguised as a huge <laughs> freaking umbrella on the top of a uh an off the dock casino. That's one of the things I love about Tim's work, and I and I I hope we get to see more in the James Gunn. Uh, run live action movies is to a guy like Bruce Tim and the people that work with him that having that what you just described doesn't mean you can't also have an emotionally grounded Bruce Wayne you know what yeah. I mean like you can do both things they can be extremely real and grounded characters in a world where you can just pull off a giant gun on a boat or people can you know Clayface can exist or you fight know, a gentleman be- ghost I mean, I can't. <laughs> gentleman Ghost is my favorite character to reference. So the fact there's a whole Gentleman Ghost episode and written by Mark Bernardin, who I love as yeah. both a podcast and comic book writer, uh, awesome, and Toby Stevens, who I, uh, I'm a huge fan of uh, as the voice actor, um, wonderful. I mean, that was a, that was a real treat. That episode, as weird as it sounds. And obviously, we're spoiling the crap out of the first season of this show. So if you haven't watched it yet and you like Batman, go watch Batman the Cape Crusader or just is, Batman colon Cape Crusader. It is so Batman. I don't. I it mean, that's so like Batman. Broad review. It is. It is Batman. 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 I mean, it really is. It is just uh, whatever aesthetic changes some jackasses bitch about does nothing to damage or in any way alter the core of this story if you yeah if you're a batman fan you can't not like this i uh, i shotgun this whole thing in like a day and a half i Same. loved it uh it's just i just think it is uh it is right up there with animated it really is it stands toe to toe with animated series it's doing uh it's it's clearly made by the same guy uh and it really does it uh, he's exact that's what it feels like it just feels like animated series plus you know, yeah, like or free of that stuff, you know, or whatever. Yeah, unshackled. Yeah. That being said, the gentleman ghost episode, 
really cemented this show for me because one of the, I don't think, I don't know if wrong lesson is the correct term, but one of the lessons that was cemented by the Nolan Batman movies was a lack of the fantastical in a way that I think hurts Batman as a whole because Part of what makes Batman such an interesting character in the backdrop of the larger DC universe is that he is just a man in this world of fantastical uh, aliens and gods and monsters, right? And, like, you can you can stray into, like, Bat-God territory where he is almost supernatural in his own, like, capacity as a detective, but... He is still one of the most iconic figures because he's just the dude among guys who can fly and create green energy beams and Amazonians from the ancient past and things like that. So when you have him fighting a literal ghost in this show, I'm like, oh, so all that stuff is still on the table and he can still like be the mortal among gods. Even if like, I don't think this show is ever necessarily going to get to a Superman crossover and it doesn't need to. No, I mean, there's a couple of things I know people have latched onto a couple of names that are bandied about in here that you may have picked up on Eel O'Brien, Jim Corrigan, that are like, oh, the Spectre and Plastic Man. You're like, I don't know that they're necessarily seeding those things. Um, But, you know, the, the, but like, I mean, maybe. But anyway, the idea always, and it's why he's my favorite character. And it's also, it's why I fucking love Hawkeye too. I know, because it's just like, that guy stands amongst the people and you're like that guy must be really fucking awesome if he's gonna stand <laughs> if superman turns to a just a mortal man and goes what do, what do you think we should do that says everything about this guy and the thing i love about it and the show nails it and what i do love when the fantastical was brought into batman because both they're all kind in the comp one of the great things about comics of course is there's so many that you can have more grounded gritty crime stories in batman things like the long totally. halloween stuff like that. and then you can have the most fantastical and have him fighting vampires or aliens or whatever you know man bats uh <laughs> but that's what i love but i, I love both sides. but what i do love about when you get into the supernatural or the the heavy science fiction is batman doesn't change batman yeah. is still like how do I defeat this? And that gentleman ghost episode is that exactly him using forensics to prove someone's a serial killer is the exact same approach as him going, what incantation can I use to contain this? <laughs> he is still just always the guy who's going to go, how do I defeat it? I don't care. Yeah, it's supernatural. All right, well then I need magic. Great. What do I use? And at the same time, you have this grounded story of his relationship with Alfred in the center of that episode. That is just so mm, perfect. This show does something I think the original animated series doesn't, which is really start to dissect the psychology of the early days of this guy who decided to put on a bat costume to fight all of crime. Yes. (laughs) No, I I will say it also leads me to one of the things I mean, and one of the things I love about Batman is he is just a crazy, he's crazy. Like he's, he's, he's insane for positive ends. You know, his goal is noble, but yeah, still an unhinged human being uh and also it makes i mentioned him earlier i always quote the great len ween one of the best to ever do it who talks about and this show i think nails this it is a 12 year old's idea of i will spend the rest of my life warring on crime now he's an adult man but he is still functioning with a with a, ch- a child's concept of what will i do with the rest of my life is put on this costume and war war on crime I mean, there's that scene in this show. I forget which episode it's in, but with, right after he gets brought home from Crime oh, Alley, it's the best scene in the show. It's one of it's with, not one of my favorite Batman scenes. When eight year old Bruce Wayne is standing at Alfred's door saying, "I'm going to fight. I'm going to get revenge for them, and you're going to help me." Uh, yeah. What I love is it starts with him crying alone in his bed, and then it's almost just like, "That's it. The tears are over." And then what he says is actually what he says is even dark. He just he says, "I'm gonna make them pay." And he says, "Who?" He says, "I'm gonna make them all pay, and you're gonna help me." And then he just walks away. And you're just like, <laughs> "That's that is that is my view of the character, which is that kid died in that alley." I mean that, that 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 I mean that is what this is, and that's an ever debate. But it is just like, nope, he stopped being Bruce Wayne at that point and became Batman. 
after I watched that episode, after I watched this series, I went back and started watching some episodes of the animated series and Justice League and Justice League Unlimited. And one yep. of my favorite episodes of Justice League Unlimited is the episode where Mordred turns, uh, it sucks away all the adults from the world. And yep. so uh, certain members of the Justice League, including Batman, Superman, Wonder Woman, and Green Lantern, all have to become children to go uh, fight Mordred and Batman has that line in that episode when Green Lantern's like hey man can't you just like act like a kid and he's like I stopped being a kid when I was eight yeah perfect <laughs> dead on yeah exactly that's it exactly uh, no no that's it, that's it exactly I also love um, one of my favorites uh, in Batman Beyond is mm -hmm. Uh, the episode where they're the the they're trying to drive Bruce Wayne insane. I don't remember who it is. One of the villains is trying to drive Bruce Wayne insane, and they've put a transmitter in his head because he he gets injured, and so underneath the bandage is a transmitter that's talking to him. That's meant to be like his brain is going insane, mm -hmm. and of course he doesn't fall for it. He's faking that he's going crazy, right? And yeah. Terry says, "How did you know that it wasn't in your own brain?" He goes, "Because I don't call myself Bruce." <laughs> <laughs> Dude, this guy. <laughs> Yeah, in his own head, he is Batman. Uh, <laughs> that's always the debate, and I'm always firmly in that. No, Batman is the real personality. Bruce Wayne is the mask, and but, this but, show definitely. What I like about this show, and it's very interesting. That one of the other producers on the show is Matt Reeves. Mm -hmm. well, I feel like this show is not connected, of course, to his Batman universe. I've seen some reviews that have mentioned that. And I'm like, nope, no, it's its own thing. But. What it does, it does carry that kernel of they're both tapping into the early days of, all right, he's Batman, but what is Batman? Right. And the long term, like, arc of Bruce as a character, right, is him snapping as a child, devoting himself to becoming the Batman, being this, like, figure in the darkness who is vengeance, who is the night, and then every subsequent character who joins the Bat family trying to drag him out of that. I mean, it is. It's always this thing of this guy is just holding on to his humanity. Um, once again, I've, uh, I I love the Grant Morrison Batman run. And in that, there's a thing, Batman R.I.P. I love, which is mm. where he uh, snaps and 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 has created an alternate personality for himself, which he says is Batman without Bruce. And he is just all grim all the time. And you realize, like, okay, well, that's you can't be that guy either, you know? Like <laughs> that guy's insane. Uh, but I yeah, do think that guy's basically the Punisher at a certain point. Well, that is the thing, right? I mean, the Punisher is sort of Batman. If he just, I always talk about Rorschach as that as the, and and mm. that's actually in his character, right? At a certain point, that guy kind of was Batman, and then snapped because of something that happened to him and then turned into this nihilistic maniac. Uh, and so that is the thing about Batman. And I feel like both Matt Reeves, the Batman and Batman Cape Crusader are both about how does this guy maintain his humanity mm -hmm. while still totally being this avenging vigilante because we as an audience want him to be that. No, no one's going to try yeah. to argue he shouldn't be Batman. But what do you give up? How do you maintain some, and and that is very much the relation with him and Alfred, which is so at the core of this show. One of the like as the show was premiering, I saw comments floating around online. Let's be honest, on Reddit, uh, <laughs> with people being like, "Why does he only call him Pennyworth? I don't like this. He's being so mean to Alfred." And if you watch the whole show, obviously that's the arc, right? Yes, of course. <laughs> That's the whole point. Yeah, I mean... But, I, I mean, but people it, react after watching three episodes without the context of the rest. Right. I mean, the thing about it is it's... Yeah, he treats him like uh, you're just another one of my tools, basically, right? Yeah, exactly. He's not, he's not a, Alfred's not a person to him. It is when I was eight. I said, you're going to do this because you fucking work for me, basically. And it is, it's, it's an interesting thing that's always been there, of course, which is Alfred is his dad, but also his employee... Like, it's a weird, they have a weird dynamic. And actually, it's something that does, not not to the same extent, but it is something that gets explored in Reeves' movie as well. Where it is yeah. sort of like, uh, hey, what are you to me? What is this relationship? 
weirdly that relationship is at its most wholesome in if if you're not reading this listeners viewers of this show uh webtoon is a infinite scrolling web comic app you can get on your phone there is a comic on there called wayne family adventures that is like batman but what if wholesome um yes and, and it focuses a lot on the Bat family and their interactions when they're not being superheroes. And it's it's very charming and uh, a light read. And Alfred is the dad of everybody, right? And it sort of, yeah. it, it does dig into the relationships between these characters and how they are, in some ways, Bruce's support structure so that he can maintain his humanity. And those are the people that reel him back to being a person and not just a maniac vigilante. Tell me well enough to know that you will not be shocked. Uh, not my favorite Batman comic, but uh, that, you know, but, but I understand the appeal of it. I understand the appeal. It's the same reason yeah. I don't love my adventure with Superman. Sure. I understand the appeal of it. Uh, mm -hmm. It's not my personal take, but it is something that Batman comics about, uh, particularly in the 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 more recent run, which we were we really that we always talk about this that Morrison to Snyder to King era of Batman is probably the best the book has ever been. Those three runs coinciding with each other are just it it, it doesn't get any better than that. They're definitely in conversation with one another in terms of showing off the different like parabolic arcs of Batman. Cause I feel like the Morrison run was the bat God, hyper intellectual man fighting gods because he is the peak of what human can be. I mean, that is a, that is a run of course, where famously uh, he fights his way through time. So, you know, like, yeah, when you get yeah. shot by a time bullet, that's going to happen. Hey, shit, man, that happens. And then having it, which is, which just rules. I mean, I love all that stuff. And then, you know, uh, Snyder brings him to the deepest, darkest destruction of everything he stands for in in the and, most horror, you know, literally turning into a horror comic for much of it. And King, like weirdly enough, draws us back into this like, okay, can Bruce have a relationship? Obviously, other writers since then have sort of like destroyed whatever happiness. And King did this himself during the run. But the whole like relationship between uh, Batman and Catwoman that King is writing yeah. is this like, okay, can we even have uh, a a person to person relationship with a Batman? Can Batman is, be happy? Right. That's the, yeah. that's the core of it. Uh, and I think unfortunately, and I, but also correctly for the character. No, it's Spider-Man syndrome is the but same the thing, thing. The thing that's in all of those that connects all of those and a lot of modern Batman. Um, Cause I've also, I also like the, the, the Tinian run and the Josh Williamson run as well. Um, uh, and and uh, Chip Zdarsky is doing an incredible job of Batman right now. But uh, wow. but is this idea of this guy who lost his family as a child has become the ultimate loner, like you're talking about, has also spent his whole life building a new family, but kind of doesn't want to acknowledge that. Mm -hmm. Refuses. I mean, the the Tom King killed Alfred in his run, which then created <laughs> this. Is Alfred back now in the comics? Oh, he's still dead. He's still dead. Wow. Uh, Alfred's still dead. And so that forces, because everyone, because like you're talking about, Alfred was the father of everybody, basically. With that, now with Bruce being the patriarch of the family, he's really bad at it. <laughs> you know I mean, like he does, because he's just like, right. wow, you're all people who are in my life, but you're not my fan. Like this guy, it's this guy who now is refusing to acknowledge that actually he's built a gigantic family for himself. Mm -hmm. That yeah. family is huge at this point. And I know there are fans what? who hate that. Once um, you add up all the Robins and Batgirls and associated characters, yeah, there's like I, 12 of them. Spoiler, and we've got the signal now, and Batwing, and I mean, my God, Orphan, and yeah, yeah, oh my God, it's it's so many characters. I mean, that's why I love the the Tinian um, Detective Comics run where he had Batwoman. It was basically Batwoman and all the other Bat family members. Where Batman's just like, I don't have time for this stuff. You guys do that. Uh, you know, <laughs> I love that run. Uh, but anyway, back to this show. This show takes it all the way back, right? It's going back to that thing about like. You know, Reeves talked about his movie being like Batman Year Two. That's kind of what this is too. It's sort of like he's he's Batman. He's established. This is not an origin story by any means, but he's not yet the Batman. He's still in that 
he might as well be Bigfoot era of Batman, yes. right? We don't have a bat signal. We have a mistrust of him by the police. Oh, man, if you want to show where Batman punches cops, this is a show where Batman punches a lot of cops. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I, uh, a certain friend of ours might also have a problem with Bullock being a massively corrupt cop in this. I mean, look, this is showing us a Gotham in which there are maybe, no, there is one, uh, straight laced cop and it is Jim Gordon. And that's basically it. Uh, I mean, it's Gordon and Montoya. And Montoya right? and Montoya. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. There are basically two good cops. I, I do wonder if they're going to do something with. Bullock at some point going forward because right now Flass and Bullock are basically one entity. Yeah, they're the two-hander of corruption that we always and see. So I'm, saying, I, I'm, they, I'm not saying they have to or even to get it back to the comics, but just in general it does feel like dramatically the idea of having those two guys split morally at some point could be interesting plot-wise. We see like some little hints of that in this series where we start seeing some division thrown between the two of them. Um, and the surprising one for me was Corrigan turning out to be bad uh, yeah. there near the end. Because, um, of course, as comic fans know, Corrigan eventually becomes the Spectre. Right. So I guess he does have to die under unjust circumstances I mean, that, for that to happen. The, you could easily make the Spectre be sort of the redemption story of this guy, right? Like, I mean, yeah. to a certain extent, although the Spectre is... A whole thing. <laughs> the the listeners on just the podcast version of this might not have seen the dramatic eye roll that John had with which moved his entire head in a three hundred and sixty degree because fashion. The idea of that, <laughs> as, as as I said that, I'm like, well, redemption is interesting because is the specter is a force of justice. I'm not sure he's a force of good. Like good is yeah. a the specter, right? It is yeah. like. Uh, uh, old school, Old Testament justice. Sure, so, it is burn down Sodom and Gomorrah levels of justice. Yeah, so it's sort of like I mean, I guess you know, it's 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 not evil, but I, I'm not sure it's good. Per se. The specter does not see shades of gray, and that is a problem. Lord, no, it is very. That is an extreme character uh, that I yeah. love. I do love the specter, uh, and if they want to do a specter animated series, I'm all for it. I mean, oh, look, wow. this show does, like, lay some groundwork for some Gotham by Midnight stuff, which you know I loved that book. Gotham by Midnight's one of the best. Yeah, I mean, th that's the thing about this, and that's what's great about this. Much like the animated series, this show incorporates every kind of Batman story, and the ten they chose to tell in the first season gave you a flavor of each Batman, starting with the Penguin, which I, 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 have, I have no issue with the because number one, the thing always one of the uh, this is always my argument to people who they don't have to be shitty, but just there's a lot of comics purists. I might spend a lot of my time with one of them who comes on this show sometimes. Um, <laughs> but you know, the 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 the, the, the that aren't shitty, but you're just like, but I want it the way it is. And my argument is always like, one of the things I love about these characters is how malleable they are. You can kind of play around with them, right? You can kind of go like, what if there was a female penguin and she's still totally the penguin. Yeah, like Oswald the like, Cobblepot doesn't irrevocably change the character. No, and Mini Driver's so fucking good in that, as that character. I, I would argue the farthest departure from the Penguin we've ever had is the Tim Burton movie. Right. Which is, <laughs> yeah, I know a lot of people love that movie. Uh, clearly. Yeah. I, 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 I adore uh, Batman Returns, one of my favorites. But, uh, but Sewer Mutant Penguin is definitely like about I, as far from... That's Oswald there, Cobblepot as we can get. There's no, I don't believe there's ever been any uh, precedent for that in the comics. You know, he's always just sort of this guy. <laughs> I mean, you know, and then you have like Cockney gangster Guy Ritchie Penguin in the video game. So, like, mm -hmm. you know, Penguin has been a character who's ebbed and flowed, like a lot of like a lot of the Batman villains. And that's kind of what's cool about this show is they're basing a lot of stuff in golden age uh, uh, aesthetics and, mm -hmm. and and character designs. Um, uh, but also just sort of being like, well, we can either go our own way or throw a couple different versions of a character together. We'll get to Harley in a bit because that's obviously the probably the biggest swing of this, bigger than the than because I will say, other than than making uh Cobblepot a woman, the character is still pretty much on brand for what I think of as the penguin. Yeah, just gangster who has a flair for tuxedos. I mean, yeah, that's and in this lounge singing, which I did enjoy. Yeah, totally. And again, showing her like cold bloodedly killing one of her children is like really sets the stakes for, okay, this is someone to be taken seriously. And this show is on a level that the original animated series was never going to go there. 
No, absolutely not. By the way, uh, the great Paul Shear, of course, uh, as uh, is he both sons? I do not know. He that was uh, yeah, the right off the bat in the first episode. Those sounded read like to me. Him. It sounded yeah. like them. I think he was. Uh, and I, anytime I hear Paul Shear in something like this, Paul I'm Shear was like, both well, Aaron know, like and Ronald Cobblepot. Yeah, yeah. And I know what a big comics nerd he is, so I'm sure he was like, maybe ah! <laughs> be like putting us in there. Um, that was great. Yeah, and and yes, yeah, set the tone. Also, I mean, I, I, small th- and this is what we're talking about. Where unshackled just means this: like the penguins also dealing drugs. Like there yeah. are like packets of heroin or cocaine or whatever. Couldn't do that anymore on TV. And that's not like grim and gritty. That's just like, oh, it's like real crime. It just makes yeah. it's like the penguin is allowed to be a gangster while also holding a giant cannon over, you know, Gotham City. <laughs> so then it, you know, Fire, it fires a mortar at the police station. And, and what's great about it is, and this has always been true about the Bruce Tim stuff, you're just like, yeah, okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, and yeah. that's, well, I mean, not? I think that's really you get into it as the series goes on but like second episode clayface third episode catwoman fourth episode fucking mm-hmm. firefly or firebug firebug but everybody calls firebug. him firefly but 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 yeah, isn't firebug a distinct character from the character of firefly in batman comics that's kind of the joke <laughs> cuz they're you're basically the fire like the, yeah yeah like i don't doesn't matter you're one of the fire guys who cares like <laughs> It's great. Uh, that, mm-hmm. that that that's the thing I love is that you have people here who are this. The, I mean, the, the, like my dad loved this show. My dad baseline knows Batman characters, you know, mm-hmm. but but isn't isn't gonna that stuff isn't for him. But it's like, oh, that was cool. But then similarly, he was like, wow, I couldn't believe that Bullock murdered that guy. You know, yeah, like just murders Firebug straight up in cold blood. But then, I mean, it lets you really get into the police corruption angle that you really couldn't do in the original animated series, right? Because, like, Bullock was schlubby and sort of, like, was a, a lazy layabout, but he, he never... He was and, and, and always eating candy and stuff. But he wasn't corrupt because nobody was really corrupt. Like, they didn't... The worst the police got was they just didn't like Batman. Mm-hmm. But you never saw anybody taking payoffs, you know, from or, the mom or anything like that. Or actively killing witnesses. No, because nobody killed anybody, of course. Yeah. Um, they did in the movie. They because movies you don't have the same thing, obviously. But mm-hmm. uh, yeah, that like Mass of the Phantasm goes a little harder. Uh and the show does the unique thing of like when they're dealing with these golden age vibes, you've mm-hmm. got your like classic clay face who's just a guy whose face can get all mushy. Okay, we all uh, look. Uh, I think I was talking about it before. Obviously, my favorite episode is the Clayface one. It's such <laughs> a love letter. And that's that was Ruckus script. It's mm. such a love letter to old monster movies. Was of course on this network. I host a whole show about classic monsters. Um, but it just it's all the references to Peter Cushing and Boris Karloff and Bela Lugosi. Uh, you know, and and making Basil Carlo one of those guys. Basically, he's yeah. he's a combination of Price, Cushing, Karloff, Lugosi, all as one person. Well, uh, and look, as a just a promo to your own show, if I hadn't also listened to a lot of Campbell and Jones Meet the Monsters, I probably a lot of that stuff would have probably gone over my head because I'm not watching monster movies from the 50s. Yeah. <laughs> I like the things from the 50s. Uh, we're back in the <laughs> 30s, my friend. No. <laughs> sure, <laughs> yeah. fine. Yeah, we're from all. I'm just saying, like we're even we're even more out of touch. Um, <laughs> yeah, tune in, man. It's fun. Uh, <laughs> but, but yeah, I, the no, fact that they can deal with those kind of like golden age aesthetics in such a direct uh, way is part of the fun of this show. And nope. I think a big part of that, and something that is typified by one of the largest shitty complaints about the show is what they do with Harley Quinn because they take a character who is so thoroughly modern and try to golden age eyes her. That's it. Exactly. Yeah. I mean that, that right from when they released the promotional stuff, you're like, Ooh, Bruce Tim has 
ima- reimagined, by the way, his own character. So I feel like mm-hmm. if anybody is on for a dramatic real, not that it has to be, but if anyone has the most credence to do it, it's the guy who created her in the first place, him and Paul. I Dean. would think so. Yeah. Um. So obviously, somebody who's not going to want to ruin uh his most, you know, probably his most beloved creation. Uh, like in terms. In I terms of like how the population loves, yes, yeah. probably the most certainly the most embraced new thing of that uh, of the animated series was like Harley took off in a way I don't think anybody could have predicted, especially from her start of just Paul Dini going, uh, "What if one of Joker's henchmen was a woman?" Literally, that's all it was. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just what make- if Lady Clown? Yeah, that's an interesting idea, and then subsequently coming back to it, uh, but. Yeah, the, the, that design of the even more court jester classic look for her. I mean, and it to, is a traditional look of a Harlequin. Yes, absolutely. Uh, yeah, not not Harley Quinn, but a Harlequin exactly is is like the the thing about it. Uh, so uh, right from that, and then you have to start building this kit because also, aside, you know, once again, we're in spoiler territory. Aside from a borderline, basically post credit scene. Little tag. Mm-hmm. There's no Joker in this show. So what is a Harley whose origin isn't attached to the Joker? Well, she still starts as psychologist Harleen Quinzel. I love the way that they seeded her in mm-hmm. the first several episodes without any acknowledgement of the supervillainy to come. And then to make her this character who's using her psychological knowledge to, in her mind, be a vigilante against you know the mega rich, right? Yeah, she's she's a a, a social warrior uh, of sorts, uh, taken to the extreme and to the like. Yeah, she, she's the she's the kind of villain I love. Where it's like, no, no, I get it, but this is pretty fucking far. When she's brainwashing people into giving up their fortunes and then becoming. King Tut. Um. <laughs> Love that. Of course, that's because King Tut is of 66. There's a lot of 66 references in here, actually, which yeah. I really enjoyed. Like I said, this is such a celebration of whatever era or type of Batman you love is probably referenced in here. They, they, yeah. they are definitely writing the show with the knowledge of all Batman. But she is a person who is using her abilities as a psychologist to brainwash people. It's just a very interesting, you start from the same place, but (laughs) it becomes a different breed of villain. And you gotta, I mean, there might be some legitimate questions about like, why does she dress as a clown? Like, obviously her origin story as the character we know is she is an outgrowth of the Joker, so in this particular like framing, why the why the the clown aesthetic, why the classical Harlequin aesthetic? I'll tell you what really pissed people off if, is if the Joker becomes a clown because of her. Um, that would really be interesting. <laughs> yeah, it it. I mean, it, I I I take it to be that it is the psychological inherent sort of fear of clowns. There's something, you know, very. Um, uh, what's the word? Like very, there's a very core fear. There's a very mm, intrinsic primal. Fear. Primal is the word I was looking for. I think that's kind of my read on it. Mm-hmm. Um, is this just something that instantly creates this sort of fear, it's similar to the scarecrow in that way? I mean, that's kind yeah. of what she is in this. She she takes on a lot of aspects of Jonathan Crane in this. Mm-hmm. Um, I would be, and she even mentions actually, there's a one-off line where she talks about uh, studying under one of her professors in college was Doctor Jonathan Crane. Yeah, and obviously she doesn't have the kind of chemical side that right. uh, the Scarecrow no, would have. It's the pure psychological thing. In fact, I would love season two. Give me a Harley Quinn Scarecrow team up would be awesome. That would be pretty great. I mean, Scarecrow is definitely one of those like core Batman villains I think of that was missing from this first season. Oh, I do like their, and, and I've seen a lot of people applaud this, they really celebrate a lot of the more obscure... I mean, the fact that there's a Gentleman Ghost episode. He's not a one-off <laughs> show. There's no whole episode about him, and he's kind of awesome. Like, they, they make him a really cool villain. The fact that they do the same thing they did to Harley Quinn in terms of, like, uh, Golden age her to Onomatopoeia was one uh, of those things that made me go, like, whoa, there's I, an A, deep cut, and B, that they used him very effectively. Well, and that's that's because for our generation, obviously, Onomatopoeia was, was a, a, you know, 
when we when we were like in middle school, that was a new cool villain created yeah. by Kevin Smith, who I'm sure was like, "Hey!" <laughs> oh, you know he wept openly when that character shows well, up in he this was show. Liked when that character showed up on Arrow, he was like, "Oh my god!" <laughs> he always talks about that. It's just like. I've been referencing these people forever. When they start referencing me, it's like, oh my God, you guys. And look, we know Widening Gyre will never be finished, and that's fine. We just have to accept uh, that. It was the Bellicosity, the, the, yeah. the one that supposedly someday. Gets never out. happening. No. No, it's such a <laughs> bummer. Um, but yeah, uh, uh, Onomapia, great. Great character. And I love the use of it in this. And I mean, also, talk about a ridiculous comic book character. Yeah, guy who speaks in onomatopoeia. I also love that episode because that's the most like crime noir sort of thing where it's like there's a hit out on Gordon and we have to, of course, then, then there's a twist that it's not out on, well, it's not out on that Gordon at least. Mm -hmm. Okay, that brings me to the one Paul Dini thing that he will like always kind of be on my not shit a, list a not, little bit for. Not Paul, don't, don't put this on Dini. That's a Tim thing. Well, and yet, and yet... Here we are in this show with a yeah. Barbara Gordon who is perfectly set up to be in some kind of... And they don't dip it into the show much, but there's enough of it there that made me point at the screen and go, fucking Barbara Gordon and Batman getting together is for some reason a thing. That's a Bruce Tim thing, man. That is absolutely a Bruce Tim thing. That's why I say don't put that on. <laughs> don't put that and on. Yet, and, and yet Deanie isn't here and Bruce Tim seems to be uh, enabling him. <laughs> Yeah, I don't, I don't know, man. It's uh, it, I, it once again, it's. I don't know if we would say that without the prior knowledge of that, but it's certainly the the floor is set. The show does not lean into that yeah. hugely, but it it certainly could easily. It's it, it would actually make the most sense. It would. It, they, they've created a scenario where it wouldn't be weird. Right. Look, and I, the Lego it. Batman movie did the same thing, where it's like, okay, yeah. in this scenario that you've concocted, it is not as weird. And like icky as the original Dini push for that relationship. I think the is. other thing I the other thing I like about it too is because uh, I I did think about the Lego Batman movie because of course in that she was the commissioner of police, which actually we know she became as well in the far future in Batman Beyond she was commissioner, but here the, making her a contemporary of Batman, a contemporary of Bruce Wayne, I should say, in roughly his age, in a position of power. Here she's a public defender, which I like uh, for a couple of reasons. Number one, it's certainly uh, that job alone tells you about the sort of bleeding heart liberal she is. Mm -hmm. And then two, that puts her immediately at odds with her father. Also interesting. But yes, uh, the other thing it does is if she does become Batgirl at some point in the show... It also keeps, because I think one of the things that, that romance aside, he is a guy running around with a bunch of kids, right? So it's like, if Batgirl is more Batwoman, mm. I, I think that also takes away some of the creepiness of maybe Bruce Wayne and his preteen or and or high school age sidekicks. Look, there's a reason we've never seen a teenager Robin in live action, because it would just feel weird. But I want it so bad. <laughs> I want him young. I, I want like a ten year old raw. I want like a little kid just fucking kicking ass. But that's just so unrealistic on both a production and a just vibes level. Because I think uh, immediately uh, uh, when it's in live action, it gets so weird so quick. And here's the thing that's gonna that's gonna actually go to both of our points, which is I think the best example that has been done is Hit Girl, right? Which both yeah. is creepy but also badass. So mm. I, I don't know. Uh, that's the thing. But it, I, I don't know. I, I, we live in a world now where everything used to be like, that's impossible. And we've seen so many examples where it's not. So I don't know. I think they're going to split the difference personally. I think they'll have like a 14 or 15-year-old Robin probably at some point. High school and, age where it's like, okay, it's not, you know. And you watched more of that Titans show than I did. Uh, I watched all of that Titans show. Right. And like they, they had a younger Robin present in that show. Um, uh, he was still a teenager. Yeah, they did Jason Todd. Yeah, because, right, exactly. And and actually, they also eventually then did Tim Drake too. Um, but you don't necessarily have those characters in context well, I, with Batman for that actually, show. I don't know why we're even talking about because, of course, they've already announced they're doing Damien, which starts from he's already damaged before Batman 
gets to him. That's true. He's I already mean, when your mom's right. Talia Al Ghul, you got issues. So if anything, him becoming Robin is actually saving him psychologically. So I guess that's <laughs> how you get around it. You start by Batman is actually saving a damaged kid. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I have a lot of questions about how they're going to do that. I also have a lot of ideas if Warner Brothers wants to call me. I have a lot of good <laughs> ideas about how Damien would work on screen. Um, Hear that, James Gunn? Give uh, John Campbell a call. Yeah. yeah, I know you've already like hired a whole production team, but I have a lot of Batman comics, so I'll just say... <laughs> Uh, oh yeah, that's always a good thing too. We definitely want people who just go. I've read a lot of comics writing movies. Um, mm-hmm. I did like the 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 lean at all of the different Batgirls slash Robins in the um, the circus episode. Uh, yeah, what was the villain in that Nocturna? Yeah, who I which is a deep pull, deep deep pull. Uh, voiced by Mechanic Grace too, who we know from the Ghostbusters movies. Mm-hmm. Uh, great. I mean, actually, we should uh, on that note across the board. Amazing voice cast. We haven't talked about the voice cast in this, but similar to uh, animated series, one of the things they've done, uh, and that that has always been the approach of, and she's retired now, so she didn't work on this, but who used to be their casting and voice director, Andrea Romano, uh, who was like the best to ever do it. Uh, Basically, Mm. everybody talks about that. Uh, But they're still going with her thought, which is she's looking for good actors, not necessarily voice actors. But also not the Hollywood studio thing of big stars. Just find people who fit the part. Because Hamish Linklater as Batman, I mean, when they, I, and I, Hamish Linklater is an amazing character actor who people, you've probably seen him in something. He's one of those guys. Um, a, a million things. Uh, he's fucking amazing on the newsroom, you know, but I know. Mm. But it was like, oh, you know, man. Yeah, totally. No, incredible, like, really well respected actor. But not immediately you're like, ah, Batman. Uh, the thing that really endeared me to him is uh, he said he'd, he'd like never had a voice acting job before this. But he was he's talking about he goes, he goes, normally when I do an audition, I just sort of do it. You know, don't think about it. Don't put everything into it. He goes, this was the one time I did 30 takes of my audition. I had to make it perfect. I, I was like, I I love Batman. Like, I just, I, <laughs> he also talked about it. He goes, I, and I think his performance is exactly this. When I heard him say this, it makes so much sense. He goes, I didn't go back and study Conroy. But that performance is ingrained in my bones, and I didn't shy yeah. away from letting it come through. I don't. I'm not trying to replicate it, but I'm also not avoiding just letting the Conroy that's in my head be there. And I think that's he is definitely tapping into a lot of the same stuff as Conroy without doing an impression. It never feels like he's trying to sound that way. Well, something that he does so effectively, I think, that sets this show apart and his performance apart is by making the Batman voice the default, he right. really puts a highlight on the fact that the Bruce Wayne of it all is a mask and is something he's putting on. And that like when no one else is around except for him or maybe Alfred, he defaults to the Batman voice, which I think is a really smart uh, performance. Because that was something this. Conroy did was his, his the Batman voice was actually more in his natural register and he brought his voice up to be Bruce Wayne. Mm-hmm. But right. but even in that show, like the Bruce Wayne voice would be the default most of the time if there was no one around to right. like be intimidated by the Batman. And that's the thing in this is this is a guy who is just so lost in his own darkness. Mm-hmm. And so yeah. like where you where you you kind of get where Alfred's like Alfred's scared of this Batman. I like portly alfred in this show that, and that that of course goes back to uh golden age he was a little mm-hmm. bit heavier set and i also like that it does sort of fit the the aesthetic i don't i don't know that i'm like that should be Alf- what alfred's always like but it really works here mm-hmm. uh and that's uh, another, we should mention uh uh jason watkins who plays uh who, who's also an exceptionally good uh character actor who's been on a yeah. million british shows I mean, we've got some voice actors here who are old hats that like are just in everything. Gary Anthony Williams, John yep. DiMaggio. John DiMaggio's John DiMaggio's Bullock is the easiest fucking phone call to make, right? <laughs> John DiMaggio would be a great Bullock in live action, like legitimately. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and Gary Anthony Williams is fantastic, of course, as Flash. D- uh, the casting of Diedrich Bader is so interesting because, of course, a guy who we very much associate with the role of Batman, but really works for this Harvey Dent specifically, which I want to get to because, of course, uh, we'll we'll get to him in a second because the whole end of the season is Harvey Dent contingent. 
Um, totally. I mean, you'd probably recognize Diedrich Bader's voice as possibly Batman, depending on how young children you might have or older children, because he is Batman in like uh, the, the Brave and the Bold. But he's also Batman and Bruce Wayne in the Harley Quinn show. Yep. He's been he's been Batman in a lot of stuff. He's, yeah. Since, since his Brave and the Bold. Once again, not like my take on the character, but I, I, I have a, a respect for what it was doing and particularly for his performance as Batman. I thought he did a yeah. great as I mean, guy. he was hearkening back to like the '60s camp era Batman, right? Right, and it was it was designed for children. I think it's a great. I think had I been a child, I I would have fucking loved Brave and mm-hmm. the uh, no question about it. And I instead, I just sort of appreciated it from a distance uh, yeah, as an adult, going like, I, I'm not really going to engage with this, but this is well done. It's totally fun. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's it's it because like I said, the characters are malleable, you know. Yeah. In that sense. Uh, um, yeah, he was, he's great. Uh, we haven't talked about the Catwoman. I want to talk about the Catwoman episode because Christina Ricci is Catwoman. Another one of those choices where you're like, oh, I could see that once again. I could see them actually casting her as Catwoman. Mm-hmm. Totally. And not uh, only is she, she's a Burton person automatically off the bat. So, so right off the bat, we have a Catwoman who is, I don't know as if we've seen this take on Selena Kyle that often which is the like it goes back to golden age man the bon vivant like lady about town yeah uh, heiress basically kyle criminal thrill seeker yeah 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 yeah. because a lot of the modern takes on selena is somebody who's come up from nothing right yeah which is i don't know if it started there but really cemented by the frank miller take right totally and i think even like because the uh, the long Halloween version of Catwoman was definitely like building on that as well, and that's uh, Reeves a hundred percent did the long Halloween Catwoman. I mean, yeah. li- literally did it. You yeah. know, I mean, yeah. So yes, we're we're not, so they went back to, but I sort of like that is that's not what we're used to. Or of course, Burton made her a sexually harassed secretary who's murdered by her boss and turn- falls into a vat of cats. Yeah, yeah, and turns into this sort of overtly feminist I'm gonna burn down the world because of I've been wronged uh character where you're like well okay I can kind of just got a good point mm-hmm. you know um whereas this makes her uh this is this is a rare because Catwoman over the years has become Batman and 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 has always has always had a a, a sexual chemistry with Batman there's a there's a there's a tension there um but this returns her closer to yeah, the older version where she's more overtly a villain. She's certainly become an anti-hero over the years. And the more mm-hmm. they've made her a downtrodden person to work their way up and is sort of, though being a criminal, a lot of her wants line up with Batman's. Like, they share a lot of common enemies even if they're... But this makes her a villain again, you know? And, and in a cool way. And also, I love the idea of she... That episode represents the classic Batman escalation thing, right? Where she's like, ooh, right. If he's Batman, I could be Catwoman. Or people see the guy in the costume flying around and think, oh, I need to replicate that. Yeah. I mean, so it's, much, she's got the Catmobile, man. That's awesome. She had the Catmobile. And I thought it was a fun episode. I don't think this version of Catwoman is ever one I want to see gallivanting with Bruce Wayne necessarily. No, no, no. I just don't think... Yeah, think, they're not going to connect in that way. I think this is closer to, and this is obviously, this was also playing on that because it was the time, the 66 take where there's like a, a just a sexual tension. It's not an actual romantic thing, but it's just like, I, because I mean, that was always Adam West was like, I shouldn't be attracted, but I am, you know, like that sort of thing. Like that, that that's fine with me where it's like, there's an alluring thing about this, but like, no, no, they're, they're not actually headed towards end game romance. Yeah, like, it, it Nation. Strikes me as a very similar relation to uh, Ultimate Black Cat and Peter Parker, right? Yeah. It's like, oh, the, in the heightened thrill of the costumed chase, they're attracted yeah. to each other. But as soon as you're confronted with the realities of who these people are, there is no way they can ever connect with each other. And it exposes a, a, a vulnerability in Bruce, right? Or like a thing that yeah. no, you know, nothing gets through to Bruce, but there is a slight like, ugh. You know, around her, <laughs> like, no, but no, but nope, nope, criminal, criminal. You know, like that sort of thing. I think, uh, I, I, and I think that could be a fun sort of thing. I mean, she's just. I mean, one of the things I liked about this was they really do treat it as 
issues of a comic, singular one story plots. Eventually they get into a slightly longer arc down the stretch. Or like we said, like sort of seeding Harley through the first couple episodes, but not really making it. You know, there's ongoing character plots, but really each episode is sort of, much like the animated series was, this villain of this episode and, and such and such like that. And well, let's get into the, the final little arc here because that gets us to like the two phases of it all. Harvey Dent is a character that is present basically throughout the entire series. Yes. And Absolutely. we see and his slow and descent as district attorney running for mayor and him selling bits of himself off to Rupert Thorne, who is this overarching, overarching crime boss we see throughout the show. Uh, we don't have the Falcons. We have Rupert Thorne. Yeah, who uh, who I think Tim just has a liking for because that was also the main crime boss in animated series. Uh, voiced here by the great Cedric Yarborough, who we love. Of course, he's trying oh, to yeah. get up. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, another guy who's you'd recognize his voice. You'll see his face and go, oh, of course. I mean, a guy who inherently has one of the best voices. God, that guy's voice is so mm-hmm. smooth. Uh, if anyone's seen the Key and Peel uh, Pegasus sketch, Oh, see, yes. <laughs> all the people talk about, yeah, there's a Pegasus. And when it comes in, he just goes, I'm going to hunt it. I'm going to kill it. <laughs> uh, anyway, but great here doing uh, a very serious and grounded, you know, criminal mob boss voice. Yeah. I um, love yeah. The, all the stuff with him and his son. That was really good. Yeah. Great. I mean, the, 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 in 10 episodes, in 10, I mean, I think what, I don't think any of these even hit a full 30 minutes. You know, they're all like the 25 range. Yeah, 20 to 30 minutes, somewhere in there. Well, what I'm saying is every character, whether they're just like, even like characters like Thorne, feel very realized, feel very, mm-hmm. you know, they have, he has a son, you know, like all this stuff. It's, it's uh, the, the, you know, there's only probably a handful of scenes between Barbara and Jim Gordon, but you get such a sense of that relationship and Gordon and Montoya. Uh, you know, it's a... Uh, it's, it's great stuff. Like I said, I mean, it's, it really speaks to um, not only the animation top class, which we expect, um, but the uh, the writing, excellent. Yeah, yeah. Look, when you bring a bunch of people who a know the character and b care about the character, turns yeah. out they're going to put their hearts and souls into writing and a good about, representation of those characters. Care about all the characters. That's it exactly. Like because Batman, you know, Batman is an amazing character, but he's also in this incredible world and has. I don't think anyone would ever really fight the argument of the best rogues gallery in comics, right? I mean, it's got to be. It's it's tough to argue otherwise. Like yeah. maybe Spider Man, but maybe Spider Man. But I think Batman still edges him out slightly. Spider Man, yeah. though, for sure at Marvel is easily the best. Um, but yeah, it, so I think that's the thing about it is the show does the thing I love, which is I want everyone in Gotham City to feel fully realized, and 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 that makes Batman a stronger character. Well, and you have such an opportunity here when you have this clean slate of trying to make this from the ground up golden age Gotham that is also populated with characters from the entire history of Batman as we know it and not just locking yourself into whoever existed during the golden age. And you bring in Rene Montoya and you bring in friggin' Harley Quinn. Uh, You create this panoply that has been built up in people's heads of just like, is the extended cast of Gotham City the most well known in like comic book lore in terms of just like a general setting? Probably. I think so. I think once again, like kind of Metropolis, but that's more like because I would say that the thing the thing with Superman, but that's like the Daily Planet newsroom. And I was say, the thing that's interesting with else. Superman is while he does have some great rogues, weirdly his like supporting ally characters are more well known. Yeah. He's yeah, a, and and it is it is more contained. Mm-hmm. Like uh, I mean, you know, we might know Maggie Sawyer, but I don't think a lot of people know Maggie Sawyer as like his police. Right, but Batman, you have everyone from Jim Gordon to like Leslie Tompkins. Um, right. I mean, that's the thing when they bring in fucking Leslie Tompkins into this, you're like, hey, mm-hmm. there you go. Uh, everybody, yeah. Lucius Fox. You know, mm-hmm. uh, that's the thing is, yeah, it's the most fully realized. Word. I mean, it's it's why it's my favorite character and not, <laughs> but not just my favorite character my favorite world that he li- all of that adds to my obsession with him above all other characters and i mean yeah. i don't mean just in comics he's my favorite fictional character period totally uh, yeah he's just the best <laughs> but 
that brings us to the two face of it all. So when yeah. we finally get the, I love that we get the acid thrown in his face. That's classic two face origin story. Sure is. And I love them ending the episode on that. And the yeah, that was good. The acid being splashed in his face. And, great. And I was like, Oh, cause I didn't know I was going like, Oh, they're going to do it. Mm-hmm. I wasn't sure if that was like a setup for next season or like that, but know that it ends up being the closing arc of this season. Cause that, that ends on, uh, was it eight ends like that? Right. And then nine and yep. 10 are Harvey Dent. Uh, yeah. also fucking Brew Baker's such a fucking crime pulp nerd that the first two face episode is called the killer inside me, which is a famous Jim Thompson crime novel fifties. <laughs> I think, you know, it's like the, the, there's, there's lots. That's the thing. There's also monster movie, but there's also a lot of like old noir references in this thing. Too. Oh, absolutely. Um, and, and like, you know, it's not, it's not ghoulish or anything, but two face looks a little more fucked up than he did when he was blue in the, you know I mean? Like, it, it allows it to be a little bit more disturbing. Without going over the top, it's not trying to, nor should it. But yeah, he's got a burnt off part of his face. Yeah, and this Two-Face is less uh, s- suddenly DA turned crime boss to now he is becoming this vigilante in a way that I don't think the Nolan movie really captured. He was on a vendetta quest in that movie, but it felt really shoehorned in at the end. Right. And in this, they sort of give it a whole episode to have him blowing through places and lighting guys on fire and trying to kill Rupert Thorne and his son, which I think further adds to this thing about, because we were just talking about beforehand, friend of the show, Brandon Jones. (laughs) <laughs> has some issues with the idea, and, and this is, hey, I don't think you would mind me saying this, but I think it'll lead to an interesting conversation about this, is his issue was that by having Harvey Dent already becoming corrupt before he becomes Two-Face, ruins the tragedy, the tragic downfall of Gotham's White Knight, which of course is mm. very contingent in the Nolan movie. That's like the whole yeah. thesis of the Nolan movie, is can the Joker take the best of us and reduce him down to, you know, the worst of us. Mm -hmm. And I like that movie a lot. And I think Eckhart's amazing in that performance. But what this is doing is a guy piece by piece selling off his soul. But I still think that's the key is even though he's corrupt, I still don't, he's not a bad guy. I, and I think when he turns two face, it further proves that he becomes vigilante. He's, he's a guy who is playing the game going, this is my read on Harvey Dent at least. And you can, if you disagree, but like, he's a guy going, if I can just get into power, and this is how you got to do it, but this is going to get me to the office where I can do good for the city. But I think that's the thing. It's like, I'm going to, I, Barbara Gordon is outside the system fighting against it tooth and nail. And he's going, you got to play ball. Like he's that guy. And I think his intentions are selfish, but reasonably good. I think he still thinks he would be a good mayor. He has the amount of ego that exists in any politician seeking high political office, right? right? Because it takes a certain amount, uh, or not even a certain amount, a tremendous amount of ego to believe that you should be in charge because you can achieve what is best for the city, the state, the country, what have you. I think that you are the person who is uh, best suited for that role takes a tremendous amount of ego and thought about yourself. Now, this version of Harvey Dent presents himself as, and even says this to Rupert Thorne's face, I'm trying to get into a position so I can stop guys like you. Right. What's it going to take for me to get there is also working with guys like you. And that double think that he has to hold in his head is what eventually breaks him when he finally gets the acid in his face, right? I mean, That's they the don't deal as much with in that. Yeah. In the original animated series, they deal way more with the whole split personality thing to the point where eventually in that show, we even get a third personality. Um, yes. It's that whole episode with the judge, right? Great episode. That's that's, that's real, real in the game, but new great stuff. Yeah. Uh, but this doesn't necessarily deal with it as directly. You get hints of it and like his voice shifts a little bit and he refers to, uh, he, he doesn't quite come out and say Big Harv like they did in the original animated series. It is this guy who all is already kind of talking out of both sides of his mouth, right? Like like you're yeah. talking about, or he's going to fight corruption, but he's going to have to get there in a corrupt fashion. 
mm-hmm. you know, and you start, you're sort of going like, dude, that's a real contradiction there. Uh, it's actually, we were briefly talking about that, but it's, it's actually the parallel to that would be in reality, Robert Kennedy, Robert F. Kennedy Sr., who did sort of, <laughs> I mean, the, you know, I don't think it's, I don't think it's news to anyone that the Kennedys had criminal connections and the, and the mob certainly felt that he was their guy right up until Kennedy turned around and came after the mob. Mm-hmm. And yeah. then it was like, hey, and, man, didn't we fucking put you in? I mean, he did exactly this, where it's like, now I'm going after you guys. And then I'm not going to say they killed him. Um, <laughs> but this show presents a Harvey Dent that is two-faced in every like portion of his action. So he is already like a two-faced before he gets acid thrown on half of his face, yeah. right? I think we're. We, I think the other thing about it, yeah, I think the idea is that he probably was a, a white knight of sorts maybe at one point, but years in Gotham have made him go, he's a guy who's engaging in the corruption, but in this way where he's like, no, 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 you don't get it. See, I'm not, I'm not really with it, but this is how you got to do it, you know? Yeah, and yeah. that way, once you start selling off, well, I can, you know, once you sacrifice this part of your moral code and this part of your soul, it just, you know, spirals into you become two-faced. Yeah. And then and the so final he's... thing, the acid's thrown in his face. And even still, this is also a rare thing. I, I, I haven't seen, I don't think I've really ever seen this, where he tries to be normal. Like there's After the, whole the thing. face burn? Yeah, like most of the time it's face burn, he's nuts. He's off the rails, he's a villain. But here mm. having Bruce Wayne be like, let me take you to dinner, everybody, and, and in fact, everybody is supposedly being supportive of him, but he's like, you're all phonies. You're all yeah. liars. I'm a hideous monster. Well, and again, it speaks to that ego because he sees himself as this monster because he sold off bits of himself. And this manifests as this like disfigurement of soul that is just like highlighted in the mirror now that it's happened to his physical body. And so if he thinks to himself, if I can become this monster, everyone must be worse because I was the best of us. Yeah. I mean, it goes back to my one of my favorite moments in uh, Dark Knight Returns. When they fix Two Face's face, mm. but then when he looks in the mirror, his whole face is scarred. Still, yeah, 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 the- because it- like the monster is always under yeah. the skin. It was never a skin deep thing. He was already, yeah. That's the thing that Tim in both of these in different ways. One was split personality. This is more in sort of his split morals of having to be a politician. But mm-hmm. it, it's like this guy is already has a dichotomy in him, and then once that's physicalized, his brain just breaks. Yeah. And I really like I, that from it, it. It really grounds him in some psychology. But I think this show in particular also does a thing that we rarely see with Two Face, which is he doesn't break fully bad, right? No, I, I also like that. You, you talked about the tragedy of Two Face. The tragedy of Two Face is that he keeps going in a villain's arc after the facial disfigurement. This Two Face doesn't he sacrifices himself to a greater or lesser extent right. like but he he becomes victimized by the system that he tried to tame but can't because that's why you need a batman in gotham is because people can't right. wrangle the darkness in this city exactly that's always the thing about when people talk about batman in sort of a negative way or going like wasn't he just beating up criminals is that really an answer i'm like like he doesn't exactly exist in a world I can comprehend. <laughs> right? Yeah, uh, he, he has. Some... He he exists in a world with gentlemen ghosts and clay faces. Yeah, where it's like something. <laughs> I saw a a great Twitter thread years ago of a guy vehemently defending Batman when people are going like, "Couldn't Bruce Wayne use his money to like, you know, help the social work system?" It's like, "Hey, man, social work system isn't gonna help." When Two Face is firing a rocket at somebody's house, man, like <laughs> just sort of this thing about like you can't put real world politics on a world where a guy in clown makeup is terrorizing everyone. When when the demon Barbatos exists yeah. and has blighted the land beneath Gotham since time yeah. immemorial, and there is one man in a bat costume holding on by his fingernails, no amount of social services can stop a gentleman ghost. All right, you know, like. <laughs> Sort of thing where it's like, yeah. yeah, it's always the thing I bring up, yeah, about a lot of that stuff where you go like, sure, objectively, a Batman would be a horrible fascist, uh, 
being in our world. However, we're not in our world, and this <laughs> they fucking need a guy in a bad costume to punch somebody. Um, so I do. Otherwise, yeah. a circus orphan is going to vampire energy out of people. So, <laughs> that's got to be. That might be the weirdest episode, and I mean that even with gentlemen ghosts. Um, <laughs> oh, gentleman, gentleman ghost seems perfectly reasonable when you compare him to Nocturna. Nocturna is a crazy episode, especially with all the circus <laughs> stuff in it. Um, now I'm, you know, it, it's interesting that we're that we're talking in Golden Age stuff because, of course, the Golden Age Two Face was a guy who is going to rob the Second Bank of Gotham on the second Tuesday of February, right? Like, it's not, he's not, <laughs> and I think that's the thing that's interesting about this. We were talking about this earlier. Is like, I think when people talk about the grounded nature of these stories. They fixate on like, oh, well, that means there's not a gentleman ghost. It's like, that's not what I mean. You know, like it's, it's because even mm. the gentleman ghost is grounded in something. You know, like there's a reason for it. It isn't just chaos and silliness. It isn't just a, a, a big, you know, goofy thing. It's like that gentleman ghost felt real to a world where you could have a gentleman ghost. People conflate saying something is grounded to it is one or two steps away from what we would call the real world, right? Yeah. So when you call Matt Reeves' The Batman a grounded Batman movie, it is because we're dealing with things that we can understand in the real world in terms of, like, terrorist attacks, a levy, or a serial killer who re looks like a guy from Seven. And right. even that's, like, a step away from real. Well, I think that's the thing about, like, Nolan took it to stark reality then reeves yeah. brought it up a little bit heightened right from the reeves of batman is heightened from nolan's batman but isn't burton's batman right and even that is a pale shadow to schumacher's batman right, right. which is but that's where at least for me that line tips past grounded into i now can't connect to this on a human level no one you stop like a human being <laughs> Well, because you stop having characters and start having caricatures, right? right. That's the difference. I think is, that, that's that's a great way to say it, yeah. W when you have these broad uh, depictions of cartoon characters, when you have a uh, Mr. Freeze, who, while he has the same backstory from the animated series, relies s only on ice puns to communicate, uh, we, yeah. we stop losing our sympathy and uh, emotional connectivity to this guy whose wife is dying. And that's that's one of the key differences between before then you tip over. The problem I have with the Schumacher movies, because people go like, well, you love the 66 Batman. I do, but the 66 Batman isn't asking me at all to treat that. Like, Bat one of the problems I have with the Schumacher stuff is you want to be a caricature, but you also want me to care that Alfred's dying. Now, see, mm -hmm. that that doesn't... And same thing with Batman Forever. Well, Batman Forever, we know, is literally a hatchet job. Of course, there's the whole release the Schumacher cut. That's a, I'm <laughs> sure it's slightly darker. But I'm saying, like, the idea of... The, that's a movie that still wants to get into the death of the Waynes and Bruce Wayne's guilt. And mm -hmm. but then you're like, but then you have Jim Carrey's performance. Which, if he was going up against Adam West Batman, I'd be like, great. E even the Two-Face in that movie is a cartoon Two-Face. Yeah. Played by an he, actor who I do not think of as giving that type of performance. <laughs> I couldn't... Tommy Lee Jones in that movie yeah. was never the district attorney of Gotham, nope. as far as I can tell. <laughs> Despite on paper, without having seen that movie, you'd be like, oh yeah, Tommy Lee Jones. Seems like like total solid authority figure, right? Who then got burned. Mm -hmm. But then you see that movie, you're like, nope, this dude is... <laughs> and wearing leopard print like or like zebra print no. oh, those movies are a mess um <laughs> I, I know there are people out there like them and that's great I, I but to me that's that's the problem with them is like i would actually like them more if they just fully tipped over into insanity and then like i said then you're in the 66 show which is just a, a live action cartoon and it's a blast right but what i was getting at is like you can still have a grounded story if you have a dude wearing a refrigerator with an ice gun, you just yep. have to be s serious and like take itself 
seriously. You don't have to be overly serious. You're still going to have a gentleman ghost, but because that episode takes itself seriously, you can still have a dramatic moment in which Alfred sacrifices himself to stop the gentleman ghost. Not sitting there going, what the, you guys got a ghost? What? You're watching going, oh shit, somebody better stop this. Oh God, Alfred's in trouble. I mean, that's the, that's what comic books are. When I read a comic book, ridiculous stuff's happening, but I'm whipping through pages going, holy shit, uh, how, how are they going to get out of this? You know, that, that's, mm-hmm. That's something, and once again, chalk it up for the billionth time, that's something I think the MCU has been very good at. Uh, You know, they have created, uh, and there's a reason people keep coming back, because people have an emotional attachment to that world. If it was just bright colors and explosions, I don't think people would keep coming to those movies. Yeah, and look, and but we've gotten to the point in those films where you can have Falcon and Falcon and the Winter Soldier say, like, look, it's one of the big threes. It's either aliens, robots, or wizards. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> and you're just like, yeah, because, well, because once again, you would actually lose the grounding if you didn't have people like Sam Wilson being like, look, we run into this a lot, okay? So, you know, it's like at a certain point, real human beings would just go, okay, I guess that's the world now. So this is how we're categorizing stuff. You know, mm-hmm. it feels grounded in a way, even though you are dealing with vampires or, or, or not vampires, but like, well, maybe vampires actually. Uh, seeing a, a Blade movie might happen. Um, Eh, might. <laughs> I don't know if you've seen the rumblings about that. I'm not holding my breath for that one anymore. Are you holding your breath for Ali out snipes in, which is the new rumor? Sure, why not? People loved him in Deadpool, so then maybe it's like maybe we do old man blade. I, and look, I would watch the shit out of that movie, but like what? at this point I'll believe it when I see it. Um but yeah, anyway, who knows? That's like rumor, rumor, rumor stuff. But uh Yeah. Uh but I mean I love seeing him. Uh, last last like report of from an insider was that it was being reworked into Blade and the Midnight Suns. I guess we'll see what happens. I'd watch that movie too. Sure. I'd watch any but, movie with Blades in. Any Blade. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, so, uh, but I think that really works to this where you're really invested. And the arc of it is great. The, the Harvey Dent arc really, really works here. And I think the Batman arc works really well. The fact that Batman in this show has an arc is important because Batman is can very easily become a static character. Totally. I mean, that's that's it's one of the things that irks me, though I see the kernel of it when I see people write reviews. And I've even seen in a couple of reviews of this show where they go like, the problem with Batman is always that the villains are more interesting. Batman's a super boring character. And I'm just like, well, that, you know. And I remember that was always the thing about the Burton movies. People mm. talk about like, well, Batman's not really the main character of those movies because he just is a guy who shows up and punches people, which I would push <laughs> back on. But see my uh, uh, doctoral doctoral thesis about that. Um, sure, <laughs> but this show does go out of its way, and it's over. It's a, it is a gentle arc, let us say, because at the end of this, we still have to have a man who is the Batman. The case with the superheroes to a certain extent, right? Like they can yeah. only ever change so much because there is a core to them and also i don't want him to i mean that I, I i think this is i have to add dark knight rises to my rise of skywalker list any movie with rise in the title i have to avoid but that is kind <laughs> rise of, of the planet of the apes oh that i fucking love no notes perfect <laughs> all four of those movies are incredible um but uh the thing about the uh, the thing about that once again is like I don't want him to stop being Batman. I don't like mm. that because it makes no sense to me. Uh, you know that's uh, that's um, yeah. So so that that's sort of a thing where it's like I, you can only change so much. But that's the thing I love about both this and the Reeves movie is the arc is about what am I doing as Batman? What is my mission? What do I represent? That moment, and I was just saw it when I because I was googling stuff about the show, of course. Um, that moment when he almost kills Bullock is Bullock or is it Flass? I can't remember which one it is. The uh, it's Flass. It's Flass, and people talk With about guy. Like, yeah, talk about like that is one of the greatest moments of seeing Batman almost break his rule without doing it. Mm-hmm. The idea that he's like he basically his point that because he gets grabs Flass's gun and shoots around him, and yeah. it's basically just like I could kill you, but I won't. I and choose so, not to cross that line. It's a perfect, it's a perfect Batman scene. Yeah. Where it's just like, know that within me is the want to kill you, but also 
the restraint not to. I think it is a mirror, right, of that final scene from the Matt Reeves movie, The Batman, because that movie's like kind of, I don't know about premise, but definitely one of the central themes of it is, okay, you're this dark vigilante. What does that represent in this city of darkness? Can you be a light despite the fact that, of what you do, right? Mm -hmm. This show's final like statement, the the episode 10 of this show, the statement on Batman is he's not going to cross a line like Two-Face will. Right. They're both vigilantes, both in theory fighting for the same thing, but there is a line Batman won't cross. Well, that's the thing. And that is sort of the, why I actually think it's kind of a, I mean, I don't want to insult anyone, but like, why, why, why it's kind of a point I don't agree with, even if I understand the kernel of it, about the villains are more interesting. It's like, yeah, but all the villains are Batman's story, right? Every mm-hmm. villain represents something about Batman, whether he be... And so for Dent, it is about like, what lines are you willing to cross? How far are you? Uh, I mean, isn't that in this? Uh, it, it, uh, apologies. I, 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 we watched, I, at least I watched this a couple weeks ago. So, But there is a moment in this where Alfred says to him, you'll never become that. Yeah, yeah, yeah which, there, there is. Like that's Bruce's fear. Is like Jesus is. Am I looking at my future in Two Face? Is this what well, I? Um, and Alfred's like, no, you'll never be that. And the arc of that is because Alfred is the anchor, right? And we see that over the course of the show, we get that with. I think it reaches its sort of zenith with the Gentleman Ghost episode where Alfred is possessed, and their option is kill Alfred or find another way because you're the goddamn Batman. Yep. And that's what he does. I always go back to that, too, and I wish I could remember the name of the guy who said this, but talking about uh, doing work in Africa and he had a Batman shirt on, and the African guy said, I love, I love the Batman. And it's like, why is that? Because he always wins. And I'm like, that. <laughs> if you need to know what Batman's superpower, it's that. It's all, he will always find the way to win. No mm-hmm. matter what, at the end, this guy, and that is it exactly. It's like, no, I won't even consider the, wor- the one where we have to kill Alfred. Never. Not on the table. What's next? Yeah. And so Alfred is the guy who, at the start of this show, is the guy anchoring Bruce into not becoming that vigilante, right? And I think the arc of Batman is... Over the decades, this guy who is becoming less human and certain things dragging him back to becoming human. And it ebbs and flows and the the stories will go in wild different directions over the years. But like that is the overarching story of Batman to me anyway. Yeah. And that, that that's because uh, yeah, that, the mission's never going to be over, right? Like you can never just eliminate crime. Hence, hence my problem with the end of Rises. Uh, but like, <laughs> it's like, no, that's why I love Batman Beyond too. Because like, what becomes of that guy? Oh, he's a fucking weird old dude who's alone in his giant house. Of course, that's what happens to him. Like, <laughs> it doesn't end well for this guy. There's no happy ending for this guy, and I don't want there to be because it violates his character. Um, yeah. you know, it's, 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 but, but, but the thing is every character you add to the Batman story, when you add Robin, Batgirl and, you know, and so on and so forth. And then eventually the Justice League as well, right? It further, it's all doing these interesting things. This character where it's like, okay, how does he fit in this thing now? He is mm-hmm. kind of an immovable object. Though as we're talking about, there's sort of room for growth, but it is sort of about like, what does this do to the, to his mission? Which is always the same. Mm-hmm. When you meet a Superman how does that change what Batman is? Well, now Batman is the reflection of Superman, right? Batman, okay, if Superman's doing this, then I'm going to be this guy. And if I have a Robin, then Robin can do this so I can be this part of Batman. You know, it's that's the thing about it is like, yes, he is sort of an unchanging character, but it's really more about how he moves around the supporting characters, which is why I think his supporting cast is so important, maybe more so than other superheroes. Yeah. No, I, I think that's right. And I think this show is a good foundation for that stuff. I'm so curious to see. It's hard for me to imagine this show with a Robin, but I'm excited to see how they would do it. Uh, yeah, that's the thing. I'm curious about that. And because they have made it so much of a personal journey for Bruce Wayne, what does a Dick Grayson or whoever that, that ends up being add to that? Also, yeah. what is or, this? I mean, once again, they've done such a good job of grinding this character and in Gotham City. What happens if you expand out and do a Rachel Ghoul in the League of Assassins? What, I mean, the big tease at the end, what does the Joker look like in this, right? Yeah. 
Exactly. And a Joker who is maybe a little bit more terroristy than we've seen Jokers animated in the past. I'm so excited. And and by the way, the restraint of this creative team to not indulge in Joker in the first season because I, he he is both the best and worst thing that can happen to a Batman story. We know this. He's mm. he's overexposed, but he's also probably my favorite villain in like in all sure. of comics because. Yeah. When he works, I mean, I always talk about, I'm back to Mask of the Phantasm, but I always talk about that to me is the best use of him. You don't even know you're watching a Joker movie. And for me, like one of the best uses of Joker is, and like that game has other problems, but uh, fucking Arkham Knight, the third sure, of yeah. the Arkham games, Joker isn't alive in that in that game joker is a voice in batman's head at that point and i think i mean this speaks to obviously the 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 hamill performance just being tops that he can just be the voice in a batman's head and still be the best joker we've ever heard he's the physical embodiment or in spiritual embodiment if he's a voice in your head of everything he's fighting against right yeah exactly ultimate thing i mean it's uh, let me compliment mr nolan on I, I'm obsessed with the last scene between Batman and the Joker in Dark Knight when he talks about, you know, I'm the unstoppable force, you're the immovable object. And his line that I, is, we're destined to do this forever. Mm-hmm. So that's it, exactly. It'll be the never ending battle that it, he's warring on crime, but at a certain point, he's warring on the concept of the Joker. Mm-hmm. The idea that there are and- rules, there is chaos and anarchy, and everyone is just in it for themselves and their own sick delights. It's easy to overindulge in a character like that because he's so much fun to watch yeah. and write for. But there is such a thing as too much of a good thing. There absolutely and, is. And we've probably hit peak Joker a few years ago. Look, you read the three Jokers, right? I think we hit yeah. too much Joker. <laughs> I think we also watched a movie called Joker, too. Um Oh yeah, strap in, John. Strap in. Okay. I do. I do. I do. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Anyway, <sighs> this though, mm, that's good. Yeah. Batman is my uh, is my re- review. Final review. Mm, that's some good Batman right there. Mm-hmm. Take just just a ladle of the soup that uh, uh, <laughs> Bruce Tim and Ed Brubaker are mixing over there. It's like, mm, tastes like Batman. Um, okay. Uh, in terms of just. Uh, what we would like to see in a season two of the show, because have they confirmed season two is happening? Well, here's the weird thing about this, of course, right? Is we know the start is a Max show because that's Warner Brothers streaming service. And then they Mm -hmm. got rid of it and sold it to Amazon, which makes no sense. But when Amazon picked up what they had already made of this first season, they also committed to a second season. So it was always going to have a second season. Cool. Uh, If there is... Like, obviously, there's villains we want to see in second season. We want to see maybe them try to do a Robin thing. But if there is, like we saw with, like, Onomatopoeia and Harley Quinn, if there is a modern villain that you want to see, like, retrofit into the Golden Age aesthetic, who would you pick? Well, I'll tell you the one that would make me most curious is Bane. Mm, That's a good choice. Yeah, that would just, like, what what it... Because talk about the most 90s villain, right? Totally. The guy who roided up Raid Mm -hmm. Monster... Um, though, of course, that's, I love Bane. I, I don't want to say that in like a disparaging way, because of course, one of the things I love about Bane is he's also a genius, which I'm still waiting to see on screen. Uh, <laughs> still, still can't yeah. get Bane right. Cause they always just mm-hmm. want to be it as physical abilities. And that's a, that's a trap. Um, yeah. <laughs> and also maybe cast a Hispanic guy. I don't know. These are ideas. Um, <laughs> uh, let me see. Yeah, other modern characters. I mean, some ki- on on the Bane thing, some kind of Nightfall storyline with an Azrael, like, like uh, it, Azrael was actually my answer. Yeah, like the idea of there being a darker Batman for this guy. Yeah, because I think that mm-hmm. would really work for the story they're telling. You don't even have totally. to totally, but yeah, that would be a, an interesting. Yeah, my first thought was like, okay, some kind of Golden Age, like Knight Templar psycho guy. Uh, give me Jean Paul Valley, who thinks he's doing the yeah. right thing and following in Batman's footsteps, but obviously is taking it too far. That would totally work. I I, I could see yeah. that being a, a like um, the big arcing thing of the second 
season. Obviously, yeah, we want to see Mr. Freeze. We want to see Scarecrow. We want to see uh, we we I, Killer Croc was technically in this series. Uh, Waylon Jones showed up yeah. in the circus episode. Yeah, but, so that I mean, and I could, I could totally see him spinning out of that. And so I said, Poison Ivy would be interesting. What would this Harley and Ivy look like? Because that's of course a team that we're all famous for. What does mm. this Harley? How does this Harley Quinn react to the Joker? That's the big question, right? If you have a Harley Quinn who has uh, manifested herself sans Joker, how does she respond to Joker? Good It'd question. Be fascinating to me. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Is that a repellent thing? Do you go the opposite way? Do you go an attraction? Do you go a kindred spirit but not romantic interest? Any number of ways you could take it. Yeah. And based on how we've been presented with a lot of the other villains in the show, I feel like we're going to see a Joker who is a lot more in line with say uh dark Knight returns Joker than a death of the family Joker who is the literal devil. Right. Yeah. Cause I think there's one of the things the show does a good job is, is stemming everyone out of this world. Right. So everyone is, is reacting to this take on Gotham, which is this hyper corrupt, you know, system where there's like a handful of good people. So much, much like Harley Quinn becomes, uh, in her mind, a Robin Hood figure. You know, what? How is a Joker existing, born out of the corruption of Gotham City? Yeah, no, interesting to see. I'm really looking forward to it. Um, They're making I, it now, so I can't wait. Rachel Ghoul, obviously, yeah. League of Assassins would be that, interesting. Yeah, we, yeah, everything's been very Gotham centric. Even like a supernatural thing, like Gentleman Ghost, is still born of the history of Gotham. So, what happens when you bring in the larger world of characters like a Rachel Ghoul, who's obviously a global threat? Is Court of Owls too easy? Well, I mean, that's because that's in the line of the Gentleman Ghost thing, right? Where it's something inherent in in Gotham. I, I, I mean, I think the Court of Owls is a really interesting thing because. It's inherently the idea of something that's existed in Gotham under Batman's nose his whole life. Mm-hmm. And this like inherent darkness that just lives in the lifeblood of the city. I would be curious to see what their take on it would be. Yeah. Yeah. Because obviously you said it as like more turn of the century kind of uh, se- uh, gentleman secret society uh, yeah. that would probably have a very unique not even unique, a very straightforward aesthetic because yeah. Court of Owls was already kind of that. There's a there's a, there's a a minimalist design to it that I love. I, mean, I love the masks and stuff like that. Yeah. But yeah, the whole secret society. And I mean, you can draw a lot in with the the idea of people who, hold, once again, like the Harley Quinn stuff, people who hold power, people who hold uh, this generational wealth and stuff like that, that feel entitled to control the city. And it's it's a step beyond even like the Rupert Thorne corruption, right? The mob's got mm. nothing on the court of the owls. They're really the ones pulling all the strings. What do you? How do you feel about the fact that we didn't really get any of the traditional mob characters that a Batman, like a Falcones and the Maronis and whatnot? Well, that opens up a door to an interesting thing too about could you also do like a mob war season, right? Where it's like, mm. could you get a Falcone coming in and trying to take over from Thorne? Yeah, uh, and and that wasn't something we really saw in the original series either. No, because once again, Rupert Thorne was what he is in this show. I guess I wasn't I wasn't I wasn't surprised by it. Um, I like that it's still the mob still serves the same function within the plot, mm-hmm. like the idea that this is a mob city. Yeah, basically, yeah, that's fair. Thorne. Um, so whether that guy's name is Falcone, Maroni, or Thorne, yeah, yeah. but I, I guess it would, be, it would be interesting to see how you would start separating those characters if they were all in the show together. And obviously we'll be getting a lot of that with the Penguin show later this yeah, year. That's going to be a whole show of that, which I can't wait. Uh, <laughs> totally my damn. And Clancy Brown is playing Salvatore Moroni. Come on. Yeah. yeah. Come on. I'm, I'm a sucker for Clancy Brown, no matter what form he Dude, takes. So that guy shows up on a trailer. I'm there no matter what it is. It helps if he's in Batman and John Wick though. Uh, <laughs> Clancy, fucking Clancy Brown. The Kurgans in this? Um, yeah. <laughs> Always be the Kurgan to me. Uh, <laughs> actually, uh, speaking of guys from the... An amazing Lex Luthor, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Always. Yeah. Always forever Lex Luthor in my heart. Yeah. Uh, well, of course, if you want to let us know what you think, uh, drop your comments below with your thoughts of uh, Cape Crusader. Keep them civil, of course. As always, not too worried. Our fan base is pretty, pretty nice. <laughs> Y'all are doing just fine, and 
We we'll haven't had a those. whole lot to do with that, so let's keep that track going. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, yeah, of course, if you want to check out more from us, we're in the process of moving all of our uh, uh, exclusive content over to a new Patreon page, so we'll have that. Uh, make sure you've, uh, you know, ring the bell for notifications and everything, and uh, subscribe to us on uh, social media platforms or like that, because we'll be dropping that link uh, in the next couple weeks. We are primarily on Instagram because a lot of the other one social media platforms suck. Yeah, I we might still technically have Twitter and or X accounts, but they are long dead, folks. So you know, <laughs> uh, either make sure you're subscribed on YouTube because we'll post updates on there, or yes, our Instagrams uh, will also have all that information. Absolutely. Uh, while you're here on the YouTube page, yeah, like, comment, subscribe. Let us know what you thought of the show. Uh, wh- who is the villain you would want to see showing up in the next season of Caped Crusader? Uh, I would also like to see a rat catcher. I think rat catcher's got some possibilities here. it would be cool. Condiment King. Uh, <laughs> oh, no, no, I'm sorry. Crazy Quilt. Uh, no. <laughs> crazy Quilt. There we go. There we go. There we go. Give me a crazy quilt. Um, you know, they could do, I could see them doing something fun like they did with King Tut with somebody like a crazy quilt or a condiment king or something like that. Where it's like, I, I was shocked the like panoply of other Harlequin victims weren't like crazy quilt and condiment king and stuff. It does sort of feel like that would be the case. Yeah. Cause the King Tut Clock King. Clock King. Especially if he wears the, the mask. With the clock hands on it, I would I would love it. Uh, actually, the Clock King episode of animated series rules. True, true. Um, so, uh, but yeah, check all that out uh, and support us on that. But I think that's going to do it for this month's panel. Once again, I don't know what we'll be talking about next month because I'm going to stop promising stuff because we keep changing. <laughs> we'll find something, I'm sure. In uh, I'm sure September, but uh, that will do it uh, for this. Uh, I'm John Campbell, and I will always be Mike Gergoni. Till next month, we're going to panel down.